Patty French. I'm a sixth grade U.S. history teacher in uh, rural Virginia, about an hour and a half outside of D.C. And um, the pandemic, well, I just think that it, for everybody in every context, even if we're slightly different, has, of course, presented incredible, incredible challenges, both professionally and personally. Um, and how to navigate that because uh, we're parents, you know, we're teachers, we're trying to navigate on both sides. But uh, for me right now, the way it looks is we have been in hybrid since about October and we have a constant, it seems like dance in and out of quarantine, depending on what is going on in a particular school or even a grade level, uh, sections of the building might not be there for a week the building might close down on a moment's notice and go fully virtual. So we've been doing this kind of weave. Um, but I mean, I think despite all the challenges of that, of, of the inconsistency piece, um, I think all of us would say if you're in person at all, that of course that's where we want to be. And there's so much to say about that connection with our students. Um, that's so difficult in the remote piece, although, Safety first. Right, safety first. Now I'm getting some word that my audio is terrible this morning, so I apologize. Hopefully it improves as we go along here, but Hedrick, over to you. Ha, there we go. You are on mute. It's not gonna happen to me this morning. I am Hedrick Nichols, author, educator, and host of Small Bites. Uh, this year has been an, uh, a challenging one, but also one of, I'm, learning lots and lots. I am middle school lead for our district, so I've gotten the opportunity to really um, help teachers through some of the, navigate some of the challenges of online and hybrid instruction particularly, and also of managing both classroom, classroom and online instruction simultaneously. <clears throat> when I'm not doing that, I am writing just released a couple of books. What is anti-racism? I mean, what is anti-racism and what is the Black Lives Matter movement? Both from Cherry Lake Publishing, and those are great ways to explain some of the things or give context to some of the things that are happening in our world. So uh, that's a wrap. Thank you, and Bonnie, over to you. Good morning. So I am Bonnie Nieves. I live and work in Massachusetts. I'm a high school science teacher at the most phenomenal school in the United States, in my opinion, Nipmuc High, with a fabulous science team. Um, I came to education through to my position in education through special ed, so I have a real love for meeting the needs of students where they are, and I am currently Finishing up in second edits, my book that will be coming out, I'm guessing, late spring. Um, I know it's been such a, a passion of mine and a labor of love to release this book. It's called Be Awesome on Purpose. And um, I'm not here to plug the book, just let you know that it's there. But um, my focus in the classroom is increasing student engagement and helping every kid see their worth and understand that they can have an impact on the world. Fantastic. So good to connect with you as well. Bonnie, Kelly, over to you. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Bahari. I, um, well, I'm a fifth grade teacher in Michigan. I work in a district of Birmingham. Um, I've been in fifth grade literally for 18 years. I, I just can't seem to get out of the fifth grade. I absolutely love it there. Um, yeah, we, for as far as the pandemic, we have gone from completely online back to hybrid to online. And we went back this week was the first time that I actually was able to see my students for the first, like really for a long haul, the last time that we had gone into the hybrid where they were in class with me, I actually, my daughter got COVID. So I ended up being home the full time that we were in school. 
was home and they had a sub. <laughs> so yeah, for 24 days they were without me and they had somebody else with them and I would zoom in with them. So I have, this is the first time and I've actually got to go back into the building and see their cute faces and uh, feel that we were really together in a classroom. It was really amazing. I haven't had that yet this year. Um, on top of teaching and doing all of those things and keeping up with Twitter and having fun with everybody there. Um, I also have a book coming out in March as well. It's a children's book. Um, there will be three of them. The first one is about ADHD and how uh, just to change the, the mindset and view of what ADHD really is um, through a children's book and their animal characters and the first uh, little character is Squirrel. Um, it's based off a book of my son. And so we're really looking forward for the release of that book. And then the second one will be Bear. And then the third one will be Mouse. So, um, and I have Noella Beckel, who's just amazing. She's illustrating. And, and of course, Codebreaker um, EDU is um, going to be publishing them. So I'm really blessed. Well, shout out to Codebreaker and uh, amazing more books on the way from this group. So a lot is happening here inside and outside of the classroom. Well, let's get into question number two. Tell me a little bit of the background. And uh, I have to preface this by saying, you know, I'm thinking about that educator who is not really connected. Maybe they are randomly picking up this broadcast on Facebook or YouTube somehow. And they're not really familiar with that uh, idea or the power of the PLN. So retrace the history for us a little bit. Talk about how you connected. And I don't know who would be the best one to speak to this, but Kelly, I'll, I'll go back to you first and we'll We'll wind our way back, and, and if Kelly leaves out any parts, the rest of you can sort of fill in fill in the story for us. Kelly. Oh, I'm sure I'll be leaving out some of the great details of how this all happened, but I would have to say for me, um, it was about maybe a year and a half ago, I entered into Twitter, not knowing what to do or how to do it, um, asking questions, figuring out how to become a part of a chat, all of those things that I think when you start, you really don't know what to do. Um, I was brave enough to kind of DM a few people and ask them how to do it. Um, and along the way, um, I met a wonderful, wonderful group of educators that wanted the same things that I wanted. I wanted to learn. I wanted to try new things. And so I would have to say, I think, and I could be wrong, but I do think that somehow the crazy PLN was where I really kind of planted my feet with David Hennel. And, um, and that kind of like, I met Hedrick and then I met Abby was like, just, you know, she popped into most of the chats that I was in, Abby was in and, and Bonnie with her science and how she changed science into like this hands-on loving, you know, kind of, and I was asking more questions about her. I felt like we all just somehow felt like we had a stronger connection, even outside of education. Then it became, okay, I'm having this happening or that, or what do you think? And then, you know, phone numbers were exchanged, you know, and then it just snowballed into feeling like I have three really, really important people in my life, my <laughs> sisters, um, you know, I talk to them probably more than I do my other sisters. <laughs> I hope they're not listening. I love you guys. Um, but I do talk to them a lot about just, you know, getting through the way that it is right now with education and how to like manage it all in families and all of that. Both Abby and I have four children. Hendrick has, you know, one son. Mm -hmm. Bonnie has hers. And we're just like moms doing our thing. And <laughs> we all decided that we wanted to um, do the Virginia ASED um, the conference. And I think that's where we finally said, hey, girls, let's do something. Let's get us a name. Let's try to figure out what our mission is. And it kind of just snowballed into the Edu Sisters. And I couldn't be happier. <laughs> well, the I team t-shirts is <laughs> impressive for sure. Um, that is so fun. Bonnie, anything to add from your perspective? I just feel like I, I explained this to people kind of infrequently. And now if there are people that aren't involved in Twitter listening, this is just 
the most amazing thing that can happen because we started in this giant world of Twitter where there are so many people and you actually do gravitate toward the people that you have a common interest with and it really just makes you stronger. And Kelly was right. We talk all day, every day. (laughs) We support one another and yeah, it really does make you a better educator to be able to ask questions to someone who has a common interest and a common passion that may not be in the building or the community that you're physically in. Yeah, well said. Want to say a quick shout out to a bunch of people and I would say fans of the four of you, Brenda Webster, John Sowash, Tracy, Nicole Smith, Jillian Dubois, uh, Dubois, pardon me, Matthew Joseph, or Sheldon A. Poth, the list goes on. Thank you for joining us in the comments. Hedrick, what about you? What What's your sense of the journey and how did you get connected here? Um, I think Kelly started off right. It was the, the crazy PLN. Somehow like gravitates to like and um, we found this little circle and before it was fashionable, we were meeting on Zoom for happy hours before we had to simply because we're all in very different parts of the country. And actually we planned a, a summer meetup and then the COVID hit the COVID. <laughs> it deserves its own article. Le COVID hit. <laughs> that just changed everything. Um, but it made sure that we kept our relationships because certainly all of all suddenly all of our relationships were in a virtual space. So right. we really got a chance to like like she says, you know, I mean for me this year it's been especially helpful because I got my I work on a very diverse, mostly blacks and browns in our teaching staff. And we kind of, we, we experience the same things. We're moms, we experience the same things, you know, post uh, George Floyd, post um, capital rights. We had this th- these, these actual fears for our families. You know, my, I was talking to the girls this week about how my son went out for a run and some people were, um, were following him, you know, and this was an issue. So I was nervous and, you know, my friends who are, my, they're two black teachers that I hang out with at my school and we were talking, we were both about the same age, we both have sons. Hey, you know, what do you think about this? And the other side of that is knowing that everyone who does not look like me is not out to get me. And <laughs> that's a good, no, seriously. I mean, I live in Texas where they drive through in my neighborhood with caravans flying Confederate flags this year, not Back in the 60s, you know, this is now. These are things that are happening right now. So, you know, knowing that I have white people who love me and who look out for me or who want my best, makes sure that because I'm not out with my with with other people, it rem- it reminds me that the world is still also a good place. So that connection is super important. Amen to that. We we need to hear that message now more than ever, I think, right now in this polarized time that we live in. Abby, uh, they've said it all. Anything to add? Well, I just think that it's an organic kind of thing. You know, relationships evolve and the friendship has, has two between the four of us. Um, uh, Bonnie and I had a connection and had even kind of ventured into looking at a starting a podcast together at some point. And I'm still saying that's still on the table, Bonnie. And we had decided because of our connection through um, student-centered learning and that kind of thing, that um, we just had this common bond there, a lot of inspiring conversations. And we always said, oh, you're like my teacher sister. And so one of the names that we had flirted around with for a podcast was the Edgy Sisters it just never fully developed and then when this group kind of congealed um and we were thinking like what could we what could we call ourselves it just seemed like such a good fit and it really is it's perfect so that's what i want to add well i like that added detail of the podcast and and obviously you know i would be fully behind that so i would love to hear that and just based on the comments i think you'd have a few listeners um Let's keep going into the third question. This is really the big one because I know, again, as I said off the top, I know that each one of you is so passionate about using education to bring about change, right? 
to positively impact society. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the UN SDGs, we've talked about equity, we've talked about other issues. So our world, here's a big question, but our world faces these tough challenges uh, in every direction. In your view, how can education contribute to solutions? So take this in any direction that you want. Uh, Abby, back to you. Well, I've the moment that we are in right now with the events of the insurrection on last Wednesday, gearing up towards the inauguration this week, um, I'm a US history teacher and it's not something that you can just pause and just, I don't feel skirt around. And so a lot of um, my thinking has been centered in helping my history students connect to issues in the past that have now um, impacted today's events. And I'm doing that intentionally this past week leading into next week with uh, helping my historians develop their history thinking skills, critical thinking skills, and in particular, historical empathy. So how can we try to understand the events of the past to better understand and contextualize like what's happening now? And uh, there's sixth graders, so that's something you have to be aware of and be sensitive to. But I don't feel that um, not recognizing, not talking about it, being intentional in our language, um, I don't think that we can skirt away from that. I don't want to skirt away from that. I want my kids to understand uh, what's going on. That was a really big discussion in my Voxer group, my uh, Aspire Leadership Voxer group. And I think, Abby, you mm -hmm. recently joined, and I know the rest of you would be welcome there as well. Uh, just this idea of after the Capitol riots, you know, do we talk about this in class? Do we not? Uh, with uh, parents and communities sort of split over perspectives, you know, is this just going to touch something off? But I, I think we can't just skate by it, right? We have to yeah. address it and give students tools of engagement. Hedrick, how would you answer that question? What, in your view, is, is sort of the way that education can make a, a positive difference? Way or ways, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll start here. One of the things I say when I'm teaching is that I want to be loved. I want you to love me, not just now because I have my makeup on and my hair is done, but I want to be loved when my breath is stinky in the morning and I want to be loved when I have bed head and I want to be loved when I've been working out and, you know, my armpits are smelly. I want to be loved when I am in a really foul mood and really cranky. You know, I want to be loved all facets. And sometimes I feel like when we talk about our country, we say, you know, I don't want to bring up the bad things. That's unpatriotic. But that's not real love. You know, when you love someone, you love them in spite of, not because of. At least that's how I want to experience love. And so I think when we talk about our country and talk about its greatness, that we should be unafraid to look at the, the bad things we've done and say, oh, well, that wasn't really cool. Um, that's probably why we are here uh, on January 6th, for example. So how can we be better? And when we start looking at being able to love our country in all facets, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, then maybe we can get a little closer to accepting those parts and then creating change. And I think that's a big part, just accepting the fact that we have to be able to really look at who we are and accept who we are as a nation to be able to move forward and not think, oh, that's divisive. Well, no, it's not. If I tell my son, hey, you're, you know, your shirt's not tucked in or you need to put on a belt, I can see your underwear. That doesn't mean I don't <laughs> love it. That means I do love it. I want him to be better. And so we want to, we want to be better. And if we accept the ugly parts, we can change. Yeah, I think that family metaphor works really well, right? It's the dysfunctional family that has that uh, that major problem, that elephant in the room that no one can talk about. Uh, Bonnie, what about you? How do you think about education as, you know, Nelson Mandela said, the greatest weapon, did he say? The greatest weapon that we can use to change the world, greatest instrument, whatever it was. Apologies to him for that. But uh, Bonnie, how do you interpret that that idea of changing the world through education? Well, I think, when, first of all, when I see the conversations that are happening online and on TV, the first thing I think is your teachers really failed you because you don't know 
enough about the world outside of your bubble to understand that you have an impact on the whole world, right? It's like that, that ripple effect that every action is going to have a reaction and it may be instantly or it may be many decades down the road. So the first thing I want to do is to help kids understand that and even in science classes to connect what they're learning to some social context somehow and to not see them as separate things. So this whole COVID vaccine and all the talk of the research has really done me a favor by connecting the two things where students can see how the, the science behind the vaccine has changed the course of 2021 and the social science behind it where who, who goes first and what, who do we value more than other people? Or does it mean that we value these people more? Or does it just mean that we have people that we need to care about, right, before ourselves? So as teachers, we want to, to be vaccinated because we want to get into the schools and work with our students. But we have to realize that the there are people that it will do a greater good to put other people before ourselves. And that's a really important thing to model. Right. Right. All your, your conversation about the vaccine is taking my mind in different directions. I'm thinking about from a PBL perspective, all of the science and math applications that we can make in the classroom, looking at all of the numbers and the, the, the typical path of, of clinical testing that goes on. And then you also made me think about Abby who modeled her, uh, vaccination on social media, I think, uh, for us yesterday or the day before. Very fun, very brave of you. And uh, have, have any of the rest of you been vaccinated yet? All right, so Abby's the first, and I think one of the first, I, I am guessing we will see more educators uh, share their vaccination journey on Edu Twitter as well as we continue. But Kelly, how do you answer that question? How do you think about this idea of education changing the world and contributing to solutions? Well, I teach in elementary, so I have, you know, the, the young kids and oftentimes I hear that maybe they're too little or they you know, are too young to begin this journey of understanding um, our differences. And I think that it's a perfect, perfect time to begin would be kindergarten. <laughs> so that by the time they become adults, we're not spending all of our time unlearning to learn because we've had this our entire lives. And I think one of the other things is that teachers don't know. They don't have enough training behind what to say, how to say, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. I know that parents have a hard time wanting teachers to even say anything to their children based on the fact that it would be different from what their families believe. And is that a, you know, a teacher's right? Now for me, I think that we have, I think when Bonnie said that we absolutely are in a position to use what we know to be right, we have to use that. We have to use our voices. I say it to the kids all the time, you have a voice. I want them to learn to use their voices. They don't have to be an adult to say something that is wrong. They can say it at 10 years old. They can change the world at 10 years old. Um, I love the fact that, you know, um, you know, since I started Twitter, another like huge thing that changed my life was being able to learn a lot about just how to teach, you know, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and how that has, opened up my students' eyes to the world around them and they get to see it as a beautiful place. It's it's so, we're in such an isolated little area that you could live in this tiny little bubble your whole life and never be able to, you know, you wouldn't even have to step outside it. But that's not living. I mean, there's a whole world out there that we wanna see and knowing that everyone who makes up this world is meant to be here that we all have a purpose. We've all been given the right to live on earth and we all need to accept that, love that and um, honor that. And I think that starts, at a, that starts in kindergarten. And so for teachers who shy away from that, I would love to encourage you to step outside that line and say something 
um, learn something. I think a lot of teachers just wait for the okay to say, this is what you're gonna say, this is what you say. And they follow this tiny script that they've been given. But you know in your heart of that script isn't enough, then I would suggest that you step out and learn a little more. Twitter was a great place for me to learn. I've connected with people all over the world that has helped me. Um, and therefore it's helped my students. And then it's helped teachers next door to me. And then it's helped, you know, their kids. And I think that, you know, as teachers, we're not alone. There's all of us are in it together. I would love to make sure that we all reach out and um, share ideas and how to how to be better for our students. I agree with what all of these sisters have said. We have we have to say something. We have to teach. We have to teach what we saw last week was wrong, absolutely wrong. I and and you can take away, you can take away the parties. This isn't about parties. What we saw was wrong. And the behavior was not acceptable. And those are the things that I think children wait for us to say. And if you walk into your classroom and you say nothing, I think that sends a bigger message. Oh. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it has to be a partisan issue. I hear some prominent conservatives definitely speaking out against uh, some of what we saw. Absolutely. Um, and I also want to touch briefly on the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals. So uh, just before I put those on the screen, ladies, I have a quick assignment for you going off script here, but thinking about what Kelly was talking about and what we've all talked about in terms of, uh, you know, connecting through a PLN, I want you to think of what would in your mind be the percentage of educators in your school or context who are connected on Twitter. All right. So try to get that percentage in your mind. And while you're doing that, uh, let me just share with the viewers what we're talking about. So hopefully if you are uh, at a middle years level or high school level uh, and you're remotely connected to the social sciences, you've heard of these, but these are the Un United Nations 17 goals for sustainable development around the globe. Uh, they're all wonderful. I can't read all of them, but we've got goals like no poverty. And as I hover over these, you sort of see different benchmarks. Uh, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water, and so forth. So uh, what this does, and I love that these ladies continually take me back to these, but what this does is give kids and educators a great framework to work from in terms of reimagining what life can look like on the planet and how we can help people around the globe, not just in our own country. So uh, in terms of my question there, I'm going to uh, make sure everyone is unmuted here and do a quick go round. I'm just curious about what this will look like. I have a, a number in my mind that maybe hey, I'll so share at I the have, end. But I've got a quick question before we go to that percentage okay. about your 17 goals. I just, yeah. so huge. You said middle level, but a friend of mine who teaches kindergarten and another who teaches second grade also used them with the smallest kids. I mean, my my kid when I taught kinder, we did a a, 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 a lemonade stand at the school for the people who had experienced um, homelessness coming from Harvey, Hurricane Harvey. And so, please don't think this. You have to be your kids don't have to even be ten to make a difference. They can make a difference even as little. So, I just wanted to put that out there. Absolutely. I, I love that idea. And, and definitely, I mean, kids can make differences at all ages. And yeah, I love that if you're, if you're prepared to take those 17 goals to your littles, then by all means, go for it. Yes. Thank you for adding that in. Uh, Mark Ryan says, these are for, these are amazing for teachers, especially art teachers. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so here we go. So Twitter, thinking about Twitter as a place uh, where educators can connect. Kelly, what percentage would you say that is at your school or, or context? 2%. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two. Um, I think that there might be some that have Twitter accounts, but they're not actively mm -hmm. engaging in, in, in chats or learning. Or I think they're... And then that's okay too. Let me just say that too. That's not like, I don't want to say that that's like, oh, they're not doing that. There's so much to be on Twitter and just be a part of going back and reading chats or being, you know, hearing other people. There's so much that's shared too. So, um, you know, 
tons of things that are being shared. If you're on, you can click and, you know, a lot of it's just free stuff that teachers want to, you know, provide and help other teachers. So that I didn't mean to be like, you know, they're not involved in it. What I'm saying is actively involved in chats or things like that, probably maybe 2%. Got to give a quick shout out to the lovely Christine Cavey, who, who is watching us. And uh, she's saying, love those goals. Great to align day-to-day -day activities with those worthy pursuits. Was a privilege to see them physically at the UN. It's hard to believe that was only one year ago that we were able to visit. Uh, continuing around, and thank you so much for saying that, because while you were talking, I was like, yes, we definitely don't want to, we're not judging educators by all means. This Twitter's not for every educator. I'm just sort of curious in terms of we know the power and the inspiration that Twitter can offer. So I'm just curious to see what that percentage looks like in your building. Bonnie, what would you say it looks like uh, for you? 2%. Yeah. Yeah. Hendrick? And I'm guessing that they're all watching right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Watching it's Twitter live. Brenda Webster, I give her so much credit. She is a teacher in our district that uses SDGs. Yep, they're, see, they're coming up along the bottom. They're watching. The <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Brenda and Jennifer and others. Hedrick, what would you say it looks like in your context? Um, same thing. I know two, two teachers that in my building who are on Twitter, um, but I do know that they're actively engaging. I have a lot more teachers who are actively engaging uh, in educational cohorts and groups on Facebook and also on TikTok, which if you watch hashtag TikTok teacher, honestly, they're coming strong. They are. <laughs> they are. There's a lot of uh, goofy, fun stuff, but there's also a lot of uh, really short, sort of pithy, powerful mm -hmm. uh, ed tech Pro D kind of stuff happening there too. I've picked up a few fun tricks. And Abby, what about you? Same. I um, I promote Twitter a lot for the um, simple fact that it has been the most the most powerful professional development that I, I mean, in, impactful professional development uh, that I've ever had because uh, it is individual centered, right? Just like we want to do student centered, this is. This is teacher centered. You can pursue the things that you're interested in. You can learn about the areas you don't know enough about and the opportunity to connect uh, with, with other educators is phenomenal. I've had so many incredible professional growth opportunities um, through these connections. I, I, my, I mean, it's truly has changed trajectory for me and my life even. And so um, it's, I can't say enough about it, but unfortunately, we still aren't seeing um, in our in our local areas, I guess, people comfortable or or knowing the power of Twitter. So um, I think there's a space there for uh, you know helping helping others connect to that to that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm, absolutely. Wow. Twitter changed my life is actually not an overstatement for me either. I would say it's it's definitely that real. And I, I was just listening to the Principal Leadership Lab podcast yesterday, and they were talking about how, yeah, our Twitter connections are sort of over time. It sounds strange, but they become like family. Uh, you really do feel like you know a person so that by the time you actually meet in real life, IRL, uh, you, you sort of have a really strong sense for their sense of humor, their values, all these different things. Well, I, we're getting it. Oh, I, go ahead. That I just wanted to say, I tell this group and talk about this group all the time and say that these are my best friends that I've never met. <laughs> it's like, it's so <laughs> weird, but these are, this, this is my circle. And so anyway. It's and, just, well, it, and honestly, when we can travel, one of my biggest dilemmas will be like, where do I go first? <laughs> <laughs> who's, whose couch will I be sleeping on first? <laughs> no, we're just going to pick a spot, Kelly, and we'll all go there. We're going to, it's got to be warm. It's got to be on the beach. Yes. Well, <laughs> I think it only makes sense for the Edu Sisters that you connect at a learning event, right? Some kind of a conference. So have you ever talked about like which conference would it be? I don't know if it would be ISTE, ASCD, uh, Something else that I'm not I, thinking I think of. We need, go, we need to go back to Kelly's statement about the beach and someplace warm. And I, otherwise, I, that's got to be the first criteria. And then we'll go from there. H Hedrick, I think you have to unmute. Yeah. 
Yes, I'm going to say that we are going to have our own Edu Sisters conference on a warm beach. <laughs> and um, we will definitely have five days of very personalized PD. And then we'll think about everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Love it. I well, love I it. think. I think if you four organized something, I think there would be, again, just like the podcast, I think there would be some serious interest. So you you go ahead and start planning that venue. And I know on that note, there were a lot of people sad. I was definitely sad. I was booked to go to ISTE in 2020 and and so pumped to meet so many friends and, and edu podcaster friends. And I, I know everyone has those stories as well. Well, I want to make sure we start to wrap this up on a positive note. So here's one more question. When As you look ahead to 2021, what are some of your hopes? Obviously, we all we all hope that the vaccine will you know, do its job and we'll all end up back in a face-to-face -face environment in September. But uh, that aside, do you have other hopes and dreams in terms of uh, education, in terms of your own work, in terms of content? Uh, anything else that we haven't mentioned here today? Go ahead and, and in no particular order, go ahead and speak to this one. Oh, look, the hopes, my goodness, there's so many of them. <laughs> We're all so silent at that point. Um, I would have to say for the hope of 2021, a couple of things. One, um, I, I do have a few books. I'd love to get those wrapped up. I mean, that would be a great thing to, to wrap up this coming year. Um, another thing I would really love to, for an education is that I would like to continue to work with um, at least my building. There's been a great conversation as of late that we are going to start from kindergarten to fifth grade and, and having social justice lessons per grade level every other week. Um, so I really, really hope that that conversation continues. I hope the work where, you know, it gets done. Um, I think it's so important, like I said, to start in kindergarten and move your way up. So I, I do look forward to that. And of course, um, I have daughters that live all over the place and I would love to make sure that I get out to California and to see um, the one that's the furthest and spend time with her. Love that. We've got a few people joining and, and uh, sort of agreeing with everything they're hearing. Other hopes and dreams for 2021? Uh, go for it. I have a more local um, hope for this year because, like I said, I, I work in the best school in the United States, in my opinion. I've been waiting to get my position here for years. And I'm so excited to work with the science teachers and the administrators there. We're involved in this Kaleidoscope Collaborative, which is the hope there, and it's a collective hope of the team, is to build these learning adventures for students that are based first on student interest and then pull in the connections to other content areas to make problem solving and um, education and content absolutely relevant and applicable to the students that we have. So that is my big hope for this year. Ooh, I would go next because I wanted to pivot off that one, Bonnie. I um, just helped our school write a grant or finish writing a grant where we're looking for funds for a uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I had to actually present research about how valid and important student interest is to drive learning. I'm like, really? I got to connect the dots for you? Okay. So I would, that, I would jump on that hope, Bonnie, as well. And um, I do hope that the vaccine does its job, that um, we get the we get things under control health-wise for our country, for our world. And I am really hoping to see my new niece in Switzerland because she's three months old and I still haven't gotten to see her. <laughs> that sounds good too. Abby. Yeah, I just want to kind of reiterate. Um, I think hope is going to be uh, coming out of this pandemic in a way that uh, helps, helps our students, our school communities, our families kind of process what we've been through. I mean, there will be effects from what we've been through over the last year. I want to do that, but I also want to do that in a way with SEL um, 
that does really address the issues of the social justice movement that's been taking place and help help grow in ways. It should absolutely be a part of any SEL uh, work that we do dealing with the pandemic. Uh, it should be a part of acknowledging the uh, social breakdowns that we have seen over the last year, um, which are all connected from decades and decades and decades of um, areas that need to be addressed and aren't healed. So I think we all have work to do in that way. And I think there needs to be training for that. And I am hopeful that we can see that how, how much of that is interwoven and how much we need to support our students in understanding this and growing. Um, and personally, I hope that my three adult sons who are colleging at home presently over the last 10 months will have a more campus experience in the coming year because uh, it's a lot of food it's a lot of confined space and sharing and uh, i want them to experience what it's really like to be on campus someplace <laughs> for their good right for their right. good only for their yeah. good <laughs> no i've enjoyed well, having my kids home don't get me wrong but you know it's time yeah, it's time. Well, it, you know, I, I've got so many hopes and dreams as well. Like Kelly said, I mean, where do you want to start with hopes and dreams? Uh, something I am uh, trying to launch at my middle school right now is a, a little bit of a uh, sort of a news show that we can uh, publish and create and record and share with the, the middle school. And uh, Bruce Reicher, if you know his work, and Paula Neidlinger, uh, they've really been inspirations for me. So that's something I'm hoping to get off the ground. We'll definitely need to figure out the the audio problems that I had at the beginning of this show. So apologies again for that. Hopefully I'm sounding a little bit better now. A couple last comments as we wrap up. John says, I, I'm not sure of that first word. So <laughs> fortunate to have Bonnie on our amazing team leading the way to learning adventures. And That's Brenda beautiful. says, let's spark, our, <laughs> let's spark our students to get fired up for, fired up for civic action. Yes, absolutely. And we've got some, some civic, I don't want to say activist because that sort of carries with it sometimes the idea of partisanship, but uh, definitely some uh, world changers in this group. And before we sign off, I do want to say uh, you four have been such phenomenal encouragers uh, of everyone really in, in Edu Twitter, but particularly of my show and all of my work. So thank you so much. Bonnie's got those amazing fire gifs that she's so good at sharing and finding. And uh, you've been such uh, sources of inspiration for me. So as we sign off, please let us know how, can, how we can connect with you. And if you've got a book or, or a podcast or some kind of content uh, in the pipeline, make sure we hear about that as well. So Kelly, uh, let's start it with you. How can we connect with you and what what uh, projects would you like to uh, people to check out? Oh, you can connect at Twitter at K-B-A-H-R-I. Um, I do have a book coming out in March, a few months away. So um, keep your eye out for it. That would be great. <laughs> awesome, Bonnie. Um, yeah, I am. I am mostly on Twitter at Biology Goddess, but I also have uh, Instagram that may be kicking up. It's um, Be Awesome on Purpose. That's the name of my book. And my book is it's based on the strategies that I've used to um, incorporate in my classroom over the years. So it, I started writing it in 2019, and it's the like I said, it's the strategies that I have used as the framework to be able to incorporate SGDs and um, culturally responsive teaching in my classroom. So it's a uh, it's nice training wheels type book with lots of support and resources if you're interested in making some changes in your classroom at any grade level. Training wheels sounds good. And now, Bonnie, I have to ask you, uh, I'm curious about the origin be behind Biology Goddess. And I'm also curious, do your students know that you have that handle? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> and, but the, so the way I got this is when I was in college, it, a biology student, because I 
that was my first goal to become a scientist. Um, I used to write everyone's lab reports for them. So it was like, do you need someone to help you in your lab? Call the biology goddess, she'll do it for you. So my yeah. hat, my Twitter handle started out as a joke. And I really just wanted to talk to John Mayer. And <laughs> then I continued using it. And now I have too much connection to people to have something that sounds more professional than this. <laughs> Well, it's a lot of fun. It's definitely like a distinguishing brand, right? So it's easy to remember who you are. And Hedrick, how can we connect with you? Um, on Twitter, most of the time, daily, all the time. So uh, at Hedrick, Twitter, if you can spell my name, H-E-D-R-E-I-C-H, you can actually find me anywhere on Twitter at Hedrick. Hedrick Nichols on Instagram, Hedrick Nichols on Facebook, Hedrick Nichols on LinkedIn, and newly Hedrick Nichols on Anchor and all of Spotify and all those different wonderful podcast places. Um, as far as Small Bites, please join me on Friday evenings at 7 p.m. Central. I think that's eight for y'all. <laughs> and um, the books, if you have young readers who need a little more social concept, context about social justice issues, uh, it's a great series, Racial Justice in America. And you can get those on Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, all those places. Now, Hedrick, you one platform I, did, I don't know, maybe I missed it. So apologies if I missed it. But uh, you're doing some YouTube work as well. You're right here on YouTube. Talk about that. Yes, I have a series YouTube on, on YouTube called Small Bites, Equity Strategies for Busy People. And in five minutes, you get five strategies that'll help you. They go from 30-minute strategies to zero to five-minute strategies. And you can actually learn uh, the kinds of things. Sometimes I talk about the SDGs. Sometimes I talk about what just happened in the news cycle and how you can talk about that with your kids. Um, I talk a lot about some of the things that my son is going so people have kind of a face have context we say social justice issues but those things are very personal often because i'm raising a young black man and, and the things he goes through here in texas sometimes are not fun and those help give people um a face to some of the things we talk about and we want to help our kids grow up to understand and, and change well i am a trying to work harder at this YouTube space. So I know how hard it is. Make sure if you are catching this live with us or on the replay, hop on over to Hedrick's channel. Just type in your name, right? Hedrick and- Literally, yeah. Come yeah, all right, awesome. And last but not least, Abby. So um, you can find me on Twitter, AW French one and I'm happy to connect people there. Um, I do not have a book coming out. I am the only person that doesn't currently have something uh, in the works, but that doesn't mean that I would be opposed to it or co-authoring. Uh, have talked about a couple ideas with some people, but currently I am focusing on uh, coming out of the past 10 months that we've been in and I am putting um, feelers out for possibly starting grad school this summer. So see what happens there. Well, thank you so much, Abby. And thank you to all of you for joining me today. Just a reminder, if you're catching us live or on the replay, that this show airs every Saturday morning, every week at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. And it's 8 a.m. Pacific so that I can get up before my family wakes up and do this stuff and then join them by the time they get out of bed. But make sure to connect with me at any of these fine places and on social media, basically everywhere, at Teachers on Fire. Well, again, thank you so much, ladies, for joining me today. It was great to connect with you in real time, face-to-face, -face, well, as face-to-face -face as we can get, virtually, I guess. And look forward to that uh, Hawaii or whatever it is, whatever the venue is, whatever the location for the Edu Sisters Conference. I don't know if it'll be, uh, if men will be welcome there, but, but uh, that could be a lot of fun. Uh, take care. Share something encouraging with a colleague if you're listening to us today and keep that fire for learning burning bright. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.